recording. Hi, my name is uh, Joe Davey, and we're here at the Bavard Memorial Veterans Center in Merritt Island, Florida. And we're going to do a Veterans History Project interview on uh, Mr. Raymond Lewis Norman, Jr. And uh, we'd like to start out with uh, a little bit of your early details. Uh, where were you born, Ray? Birmingham, Alabama, Birmingham. January 31st, 1935. And who were your parents and what, what did they do? Uh, Raymond L. Norman uh, was a postal employee and during WW2 he went, uh, uh, wound up in the Merchant Marines uh, for uh, service then. My mother took his job at the U.S. Post Office until uh, he came back. Uh, did you have any brothers or sisters? I had one brother uh, who was killed at Auburn University. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, what were your parents' feelings about you joining military service? Were they in favor? Well, when, when I first joined, I was 17 and a half years old. It was the first opportunity I joined uh, Naval Air Reserve Fleet Air Service FASRON 681 in Birmingham, Alabama. Oh, okay. And then the rest is history. <laughs> Did you hold any jobs before entering the service? Uh, any jobs? Civil? I mean, uh, yeah, I, I was always employed. I was working two jobs uh, simultaneously. Oh, really? Uh, the reserves. Mm -hmm. And uh, the uh, and the civilian employment. Well, uh, were you drafted or did you enlist? Uh, I enlisted in the like I said in the Naval Air Reserve, mm -hmm. uh, age 17 and a half, and was in for four years. Um, and uh, then I had a job offer from a Standard Oil subsidiary in Venezuela uh, after I graduated from college. Auburn University, a bachelor's in mechanical engineering. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to go uh, as a single person to Lake Maracaibo and drill for oil. Uh, however, the draft board had other ideas. I had to get a passport. The passport I couldn't get until I served in the military. I was in the military already for four years at that time. So I uh, wound up uh, being able to enlist in the, or transfer, uh, to the uh, Alabama National Guard, 31st Dixie Division, and I changed my skill uh, sets from an aviation ordnance, working bombs and rockets and 50 caliber machine guns, transferred that to an aviation mechanic with the uh, Alabama National Guard. Uh, why did you join? Why did I join? Why did you join the military? Yeah. Oh, I was impressed. Uh, the young man uh, on the next street from where I lived in the neighborhood had on this neat white uniform, and I uh, didn't realize that there was work connected to it, but uh, he said he took off his uniform, white uniform, and he had to put on dungarees. I said, no, uh huh he said, and we get paid. I said, money? Yeah, well, I was a high school senior, broke, <laughs> etc. And uh, so every, uh, every month we got a little check. And if you flew four hours, uh, you got a little added check, added money. Um, what was your first assignment after basic training? Uh, well, I did two basic trainings. One was the Navy, mm -hmm. uh, Naval Air Reserve. We did that in Birmingham, Alabama at the uh, Birmingham Airport. And then after a year or so, uh, going to college, going to reserves and working for the uh, Birmingham Post Office, mm -hmm. uh, I went to uh, 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 basic training, no, basic training in Birmingham, Alabama. I went to an advanced course ordinance uh, in uh, New Orleans, Louisiana, 
and uh, where I was in a small class, but I was outstanding student, really? 4.0 <laughs> okay. Navy parlance, that's an A. a. Uh, did you uh, qualify with any special equipment like vehicles, aircraft, or radios, weapons? Uh, with the Navy, yeah, we uh, were qualified to handle big bombs, uh, 50 caliber machine guns, we qualified with uh, hand weapons, uh, right. uh, reloaded bombs. Uh, uh, you do, you actually did load ordnance on uh, on aircraft. Uh, oh yeah, yeah yeah. Uh, uh, but and mostly uh, it was during the uh, annual training periods, and we would use uh, small um, smoke-filled uh, grenades that would give the pilots uh, indication where they're they're dive bombing. If it was uh, successful or not. So. Um, what was the hardest part of military life for you to get used to or adapt to? Uh, well, the, I guess in the Naval uh, Reserve, uh, the hardest part was to having a fire guard um, job at night. And you had to work your regular shift one day. Then you went on fire guard where you were up all night, and then you had to work in regular shift the next day. Uh -huh. And uh, little did I realize that was preparing me for desert storm. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, was it much more difficult uh, being in wartime than it was the peacetime military, as far as the you know work hours and. Uh, well, if I can advance to Desert Storm and mm -hmm. some other actions, uh, we we had uh, you know a lot of time that you were on duty. Mm -hmm. Whether you were uh, active, in my case, actively flying, uh, not as a pilot, but as a crewman. Um, but we'll get to that later. Okay. Um. Well, what was the easiest part of the military lifestyle to get used to? <laughs> uh, it, it was all a pleasurable experience. You enjoyed the military? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. yeah. I liked it too. I, that's why I'm. That's why we're here, I guess. And uh, we, I kind of look look back at those days that we served, and it was. Uh, uh, I I liked everything about the military myself. Yeah. Uh, were you in combat, uh, combat support, or combat support role? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> um, Where were you at when you were in combat? Can you? Well, uh, we our um, reserve naval reserve unit from no, I'm sorry, Army Reserve from Orlando, and we had a uh, an operation out of Key West. Uh, during, not during the Cuban Missile Crisis, but later on, uh, the Russians were coming down. Uh, they were training with the uh, Cubans, and uh, we had a uh, patrol uh, set up uh, monitoring uh, the Russian and the uh, you know, Cuban uh, communication. And uh, we would uh, fly up and down over the forest straits and intercept and record and that sort of thing. Right. May I say that we had one pilot, we had to stay 12 miles offshore, and we had one pilot whose first name was Lou, L-O-U. Lou was a professional, during the week, a professional airplane pilot, commercial. But then he would also like to, uh, reservist came and uh, was on the uh, on the operation. Well, staying 12 miles off the coast became a challenge, and and Lou kept getting closer and closer to the um, to the Cuban mainland, and we had one uh, Mig who came and flew by, and he turned sideways to let us see his rockets and his bombs. And uh, 
we, we were saying uh, to Lou, loosen up, Lou. Get off the coast, Lou. Loosen up, Lou Lippy. That got, a nice guy. Getting a little too close. He was telling you that you were a little too close. Right? Yeah, the Russian Meg was. Yeah. Uh, and did you stay in touch with uh, family and friends when you were... Still to this day, uh, one of the, the closest uh, uh, people are, are uh, over in Orlando. Um, this fellow was a, a, a Morse code intercept operator, as I was, uh, and, and the, he and his wife both were in the unit that I was in, 138th Aviation Company. Electronic warfare. Okay. Um, what did you, did you do for recreation when you were off duty? We, <laughs> we didn't have much time. Really? But, well. During and, wartime, it's pretty much that you, you don't get too much time off. Yeah. In Desert Storm, the, the only uh, active, uh, call it once or twice, uh, we were able to go downtown Riyadh. And that was an adventure with uh, the Muslim women and their black abayas, I guess it is. And uh, Did you have any special rules or regulations that you had there while you were over there with, with your relationships with the women? There was none. No. You couldn't look, you couldn't see, you couldn't talk to them. Um, and it was best, we just called them BMOs, Black Moving Objects. <laughs> was there anything you did for uh, good luck? Prayed. Prayed? Uh, what, what was the best part of your, uh, your uh, wartime service experience? Uh, again, in Desert Storm, the best part would be to take MREs, meals ready to eat, and mix them up with fresh vegetables or something like that. And we had a kind of a little apartment. Mm -hmm. um, that was uh, probably one of the lesser stress. Mm -hmm. So you had time off. You did have uh, time off to, to relax. You weren't I know when you're uh, actually in the trenches, it's like sometimes it's like 12 on, 12 off during wartime. Was it was it? 12 on, it, 12 off. It was 12 on, 12 off. Yeah. Uh, uh, do you recall the day that your service ended? January 31st, uh, 1960, I guess it is. 1960? Uh, that's, and that's not quite correct. I was, I was 60 years old, uh, almost to the day. Uh, and my uh, retirement papers were in. The commander of this 138th Aviation Company asked me to stay. He could extend me for two more years. And I said, thank you, uh, I'll decline. All right. And you did have uh, quite a few uh, civilian jobs while you were in the military. You were in the, uh, the, uh, the reserves and the National Guard. Uh, so you did, would you like to talk about your uh, extra civilian or civilian contractor jobs or NASA jobs? Oh, uh, yeah. I, uh, I started out uh, with an offer, a job offer from a Standard Oil Company to go to uh, Caracas, Venezuela, I mentioned, uh, to work in the oil field. And uh, the oil uh, prices dropped to two dollars a barrel. Repeat two dollars a barrel. Yeah. What are they, 100 and 100 quarter now? Uh, so at any rate, the, uh, the job offer with the oil company fell through. Uh, I went to work for uh, a, st a Stockholm Valves and Fittings who made valves and fittings for the oil industry. <laughs> and shortly after I went to work for them, they, uh, they had to lay me off. So I went down the street in Birmingham to Hayes Aircraft International became a, um, uh, well, I did a number of engineering jobs for them, one of the which I worked on a secret project, uh, which uh, 
took, uh, it, it was a, a jet engine and it was a, to design a uh, collar uh, that would allow cold ambient air to go around the jet engine and come out the back uh, and with, with cooler temperature. And that way the infrared uh, seeking missiles would be confused, hopefully. Mm -hmm. Now, fast forward to Desert Storm, uh, we had uh, a secret maneuver where the pilots were instructed if they, if, if infrared friend or foe, something like that, if it alarmed, they were supposed to turn the airplane upside down or vertical and rotate. And we had that experience coming back from uh, over King Khalid Military City up in northern Saudi Arabia. And uh, it was uh, kind of exciting watching the King Khalid uh, aviation, the landing lights rotate. Oh, yeah. They weren't rotating, we were, we rotating. were rotating. So wow. the idea here is that fast forward from 1958-59 and that secret project tool, Desert Storm, that that uh, idea uh, kept, uh, kept, kept going. Um, did the GI Bill support your education? None. None? You had to pay for it yourself? But, uh, all Three through. jobs. Yeah. Two jobs, yeah. Uh, did your military service change you in any way? Good question. I hadn't thought about, yeah, thought about that. <laughs> uh, did you continue any friendships after after service? Yeah, I mentioned uh, my, my buds, uh, Danny Peck and his wife Muriel in mm -hmm. Orlando. A number of the guys have passed away already. Uh, and there's a few that we uh, monitor on Facebook. Mm -hmm. but, uh, uh, how about your, your uh, working for NASA uh, later on? Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I went through, uh, from getting laid off in Birmingham, I, I was still interested in going to uh, off to a foreign country working. And uh, one of the uh, responses I got back was from St. Petersburg as an architect engineer, uh, sanitary and mechanical engineering, and then got another offer from Pan American that came through uh, at uh, Cape Canaveral, which I took, which eventually led to employment with NASA for about th almost 30 years. And I did uh, launch operations, which uh, included everything from weather forecast to propellants and, you know, that sort of thing. He's had a, a, a very interesting and varied career. Uh, and uh, do you, did you join any veteran organizations after, after service? Not immediately. Um, I, uh, but today I'm a life member of the VFW, a life member to American Legion, a life member here at the Brevard Veterans Center, mm -hmm. and uh, who knows, maybe another one in the future. <laughs> okay. uh, you have any message you'd like to leave for uh, future generations who, who will hear this? Uh, Absolutely. I think the draft should be instituted or a civilian equivalent, whether it's a Peace Corps. I, I don't know if the Peace Corps still exists, but I think every young male and female should have some kind of military equivalent. Uh, back there in the 30s, it was Civilian Conservation Corps. Uh, then we uh, fast forward to the 60s, I guess, and we had uh, a Peace Corps Etc. Burning draft cards, burning bras, t to me is unacceptable. Leave it at that. Um, is there anything else we we need we need to talk about that uh, you feel like we haven't covered? Uh, 
Yeah, uh, as a matter of fact, I'll mention this one thing. Uh, <clears throat> there are a number of veterans that, uh, that are buried uh, around, uh, not only in Vietnam and Europe or whatever, but there are veterans right here in Brevard County that, that are uh, unrecognized. I'm more, as we speak right now, I'm working on identifying the location of the grave of a gentleman, last name Cook, who is at the uh, Indiola Cemetery. I know basically where he is in a general area of 20 feet by 60 feet. And the only way <laughs> to find him is either by probing to find his grave um, or a uh, uh, metal detector, maybe, or a ground uh, penetrating radar. And uh, I'm a little foggy this morning because I've been up early trying to find a, a, a uh, metal detector, and I had one promise, but it didn't show up t today. Um, there, I, I may wind up buying one and just myself, mm -hmm. I, I don't know. Are you going to relocate his remains, or are you just going to ident properly identify? What, what's your objective? Uh, to get a headstone for this okay. guy. Oh, okay. It, it follows with the uh, Tuskegee Airmen, uh, and uh, three years ago, a Marine, Bill Kowasik, and I found the remains, uh, cremains, of uh, a Tuskegee Airman at uh, St. Luke's Episcopal Church. And uh, as we were probing, the priest came out waving his arm, screaming at the top of his lungs, stop the digging, stop the digging. And the short story here is uh, we were able uh, to we did not violate Florida law on desecration of graves, etc. So, and, and we're able to give the Tuskegee Airmen and his wife a uh, uh, proper military uh, funeral at the Cape Canaveral National Cemetery. Okay, so you're doing a lot of work nowadays. Now that you're uh, retired. Uh, with vet, with veterans, and you, what would you wish more people knew about veterans? <clears throat> Every one of them uh, has offered to put their life on the line, and uh, many of them have millions, millions, mm -hmm. and uh, no matter if you're active duty full time, a grunt, uh, marine, and storm in the beaches, or. Uh, somebody, I don't know, what did you do? What was your job? Oh, myself, I, I was a missile guidance specialist. I, I was a technical, and a lot like you, I had to do with the ordinance, make sure that the missiles were, were in working order. We tested them, uh, tested the guidance systems, and, and we took them out to the, we assembled them, put, took them out to the flight line. It was a lot like what you did in your first uh, service. You were, where you did the uh, loaded ordinance on the what kind of uh, aircraft was it? Like uh, the ones we had, well, we had two kinds, three kinds. Uh, the ones that we used the ordnance on <clears throat> were uh, Corsair F-4Us. Okay. And that's the kind Happy Boynton flew in the South Pacific <clears throat> with a movie of the same name. I mean, TV, I guess yeah. it is. Um, we loaded uh, the. Uh, yeah, that's a that's a real classic air aircraft. I, yeah, I think most everyone knows is familiar with that right. aircraft, and it, they had the Marines had it, and uh, the, the aircraft carriers had it too. Yeah. It was difficult. It was a little difficult to land, but it yes, was a it, did. it, it was, was a very powerful. I think it had like a over a thousand horsepower ra radial and, engine. And four, the propellers, I think, were fourteen feet in diameter mm -hmm. from top to bottom. And, and you say, well, you were a reservist. Yeah, you didn't do anything. Well, on the trip to Cuba, when they reassigned us from Korea to Cuba, we had a pilot whose last name was Smith, and they took the F4Us from 
Birmingham, Alabama. They refueled at Boca Chica Naval Air Station, which is just north of Miami. And this uh, Lieutenant Smith, uh, on takeoff, leaving uh, Miami to go to Guantanamo Bay, hit the increase in the runway, two runways crossed, big bump, hit, turned over, broke his neck. Oh Killed. yeah, that's terrible. So, that's, a, that's a part of it. It is, is actually dangerous. Uh, uh, the military service is very dangerous. Well, Norm, we'd, we'd like to thank you very much for this interview. It's uh, very interesting and it'll, I'm sure it'll be, uh, what we'll do is we'll, we'll make it available at the Library of Congress and we'll also upload it to uh, YouTube uh, and our <laughs> YouTube channel and uh, we'll let you forward uh, links to anyone that you would like to, to, re to, to see very it. Good. All right, thanks again. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. It's been a pleasure. All right.